Hey guys, welcome back to Release the Crafting. Priscilla here with another episode of Storycraft. Um, if you guys are just now joining me, Storycraft is a series where I craft and tell stories at the same time. Welcome. I hope you like it. Uh, for the month of February, we are doing stories themed over love. And this is our last one for the month. So I thought we would uh, kick it off with a myth from India whose title I'm not going to actually tell you because it's a total spoiler. So for right now, we're just going to call it the tale of Savitri and Satyavan. And I'm going to just drop a little bit of a, um apology, I guess, up front. I'm going to do my best with these names. I have spent a lot of time listening to how to pronounce them. I'm still going to get them wrong because speech impediments got a speech impediment, you guys. Um, bear with me. Provide phonetic instructions on how to pronounce these things in the comments below if you see that I have erred, but if you yell at me, I swear I will fight you on the internet. So, <laughs> that being said, the tale of Savitri and Satyavan, let's get into it. There once was a king of the Madra kingdom named Ashwapati, who married a beautiful woman named Malavika and made her his queen. And I just, I'm only really going to point out, you guys, I love, love a named character. More so when it's a named female character. So this story already topped here in my world. But at any rate, Ashwapati and Malavika were very happy together. And they lived for many years, um, not wanting for anything, but the thing that they desired most. Can you guess what it is? It's a trope now. It's a baby. Um... So for some reason, they wanted a child. I'm kidding. I love children that aren't mine. Um, but they wanted this child. Uh, and they were very, very devout and super religious. And they constantly prayed and asked the gods to bless them with a the child. But they just didn't have any luck with it. Um, and they endured this pretty quietly outside of their prayers. And preferred to live a life of asceticism. Which isn't to be confused with aesthetics. Um, it means that they, like, stayed away or abstained from all forms of, like, indulgence and just lived a really basic life. Like, no fancy meals, no fancy clothes. Like, they were living basically as beggars or as beggarly as you could in a palace as the king and queen. Keeping it real basic. Um, as, like, an offering of devotion um, to Savitir, the sun god. Every day, King Ashwapati prayed to Savitir um, for a child, so much so that Savitir paid attention and was pleased with his devotion to him in particular that he appeared before the king and he told him, you'll have a daughter very soon in honor of your service. So they did eventually have a daughter, Savitri, Savitir. Oh my gosh, these names. <laughs> Sorry. So Savitir did bless them with a daughter named Savitri for the sun god who, of course, made this daughter situation happen. Um, and Savitri was a actual gift, like a total blessing from the gods. She was the perfect child, kind-hearted, well-behaved, super devoted, not just like religiously, but also to her parents. She was very polite, soft-spoken, and beautiful. Stupidly beautiful, guys. Let me tell you how beautiful Savitri is. She is so beautiful that when she comes of age and, like, it's about the time for her to get a marrying, all these merchants and nobles and random dudes are like, we're going to marry this girl because we keep hearing about how beautiful she is. They all get to the palace and get an audience with her and then are absolutely struck dumb, like, dead silent, cannot speak, no words, no brain. Because that's how beautiful she is. She's so beautiful that she has like a radiant quality that like emits light from her. Like she, literally sun god made a sun child. She's perfect. She's beautiful. She's amazing. Uh, the only problem is all these men are struck stupid by her beauty and she is absolutely unimpressed. She doesn't find any of this cute or charming or like, you know, endearing in any way, shape or form. She's just like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> If you could see past my face for just a second, you would see that I'm not about this. 
So she would send all these guys away. And, you know, she was just rejecting proposal after proposal. And, of course, these guys couldn't make the proposal to her because when they would see her, they were at a loss for words. And it kind of got to the point where her dad is like, oh, my God, could you marry somebody, anybody, like, pick a person and she's like no none of these guys who are coming here are doing it for me and she takes this attitude all the way out to the stables she saddles up a chariot and she leaves to go find her own husband which like yes yes <laughs> so she takes this chariot and she starts traveling from place to place you know from village to village um looking for a man that you know isn't equal to her and she doesn't find anybody until she starts to pass uh through the woods one day and she meets this young woodcutter whose name is Satyavan and he was not struck dumb by her beauty um he did think that she was very beautiful but he also just carried on a casual conversation with her and this is the first time that like Savitri has been able to have a conversation with a man other than her father that you know she was just like what oh the weather is wonderful. Thank you for asking. And, you know, they continue to have this conversation. She's so enamored by this man who happens to be pretty good looking himself um, that they keep on having this conversation for hours and they talk about everything. You know, they talk about the forest, the business that he's in, her childhood, his life. Everything is great. They're shooting the shit. And Throughout this conversation, Savitri starts to get this feeling that Satyavan's actually, although a very nice young man, really deeply unhappy, like, just very unsettled within himself. So she asks him, like, what's up? Like, I can tell that you're, you're trying to maintain this happy face, but you're not actually really that happy. And he tells her, well, it's because when I was a kid, my parents were a wealthy ruler of their own kingdom. Making Satyavan a prince for our princess. And he goes on to tell her the story about how his father was betrayed by his people, um, blinded in a coup, and they were overthrown and exiled from their home and have now been living out here in the woods as exiles, as paupers. And he's been working really hard every day to dutifully support his family as a woodcutter. And she's so moved by his story and his utter devotion to his family, because remember, she is also very devoted to her own family, that she looks deep into his eyes and she knows that she's found an equal. She's found the man that she's looking for, the man she's going to marry. And... Like, when I tell you guys, this girl was starred for conversation, like nobody's business. It took her a couple of hours talking to one person to be like, I'm going to lock this down. This is it for me forever. So she gets back in her chariot. She hurries home to tell her father the news. And she finds him deep in conversation with Narud, a traveling sage and messenger from the gods. Um, So she interrupts this conversation because she is that excited for the news. Her father also equally excited they match energies and he's like let's start playing this wedding i want this done like asap he clearly could not wait to marry her off which is crazy to me because he wanted this child so desperately but once she got like old enough he was like get the fuck out do something with your life marry now so they're going back and forth talking about this plan they want everything she wants for her dream wedding and narud's like <clears throat> I'm still here. And he stops his celebration to tell them he's had a prophecy, a vision. Satyavan only has a year from this day to live. And Savitri's heart breaks into like a million pieces. She's finally found the love of her life and like he's gonna die. She's gonna get only a year from him and that's it. So she, you know, she feels this chill run through her spine and the king tries to talk her out of marrying Satyavan because he's like, oh man, I really, really wanted you to get hitched, but I don't think this is gonna work. If he's gonna die in a year, you're just gonna be here, a widow and like unmarried. And that's the opposite of everything I want. And she's like, stop yourself. 
um, my nerve and my resolve is made of steel. So she swears before Narud and her father and the gods that she's never going to marry another man. Satyavan is her one and only love and the, their fates are entwined together forever. She swears this in front of every single person that's around her to the higher beings that surround her. Every god that she can think of, she swears this to. Their fates are entwined. It's Sat Yavan or bust. So being moved by her conviction, Naru tells her to start a strict regimen of prayer, fasting, and some herbal concoctions to help stave off Sat Yavan's early death. Like, do witchcraft. Holy witchcraft, but, but do witchcraft and maybe he won't die. Um, but as part of this, like, strict regimen, they have to go... And live away from the palace and live as humbly and as plainly as possible. So, again, asceticism, they can't indulge in excess. They can't enjoy the perks of royalty. They got to get the fuck out of the castle. Which, like, I'm sure her dad was like, oh, I've been there. Yeah, I understand. Except, like, he didn't have to leave his home. So, maybe not sane. Um, but that's what happens. She moves out. And they go and live a quiet, humble life, settling in a jungle in a hut where Sat Yuvan can continue to work, doing his trade as a woodcutter and supporting his family. But now she's there. And they were really happy together, despite um, the princess having to like downshift and live a simpler life. Um, she didn't actually want for anything. So she was totally chill having to live a simpler life with him in the woods as long as they were together their love just got like stronger every single day and she never complained never like missed anything she never made Sat Yavon feel bad for the fact that she had to like downgrade into his quiet peasant life so on their first anniversary uh Savitri decides you know because they got married the same day i don't think i mentioned that they got married that day so she like heard the prophecy heard the solution ran over there and they got married instantly so an exact year from this day their first anniversary she asked uh her husband if she could accompany him to the woods and at first he was surprised because she's never asked him for anything like she wasn't even like could you pass the salt never asked him for anything that entire year they were together and he figures since she's finally asked him for something the least he can do is give her her simple request even though it's a super hot day and it's probably not going to be fun he's like yeah totally come with me i would love to have you so as they're out there, you know, trawling through the woods, the sun starts to get hotter and hotter, like unbearably, unspeakably hot. And while they're out there, Savitri can see, you know, from her position, watching uh, Sat Yuvan work, that his brow is beginning to burn. So she runs out from the shade where she'd been sitting under to go save him. And she manages to drag his back, like him back to the shade, but he collapses and it was already too late. Underneath the trees, his body grew cold despite the heat, and he was still and totally, truly dead. This was devastating. But our hero, Savitri, she wasn't shaken, guys. She looked around, and she sees that the messengers of death come to retrieve his soul. And at first, they were also awestruck by how beautiful Savitri is, like most men. They were like, whoa, that girl is way too pretty. And she has this heavenly aura. Because remember, she's like a literal gift from the gods. So they left. They were like, that girl's too pretty. She's also like godly. So we're not going to touch that guy that she's next to because that's too much. That's too much to ask for any messenger to do. So what happens is they go back without the soul. And now they have to report to the god of death, Yamaraj, to come back and get like the soul himself because they won't go. They're like... No, that's a goddess over there. She's clearly a goddess because she's super beautiful um, and we can't defy a goddess. So Yamaraj is like, okay, I'll do it myself. Like, fine. So Savitri is like, you know, just crying over her husband and she looks up and through the veil of her tears, she sees this towering figure on the horizon and it was Yamaraj. And he's coming to take Sat Yvonne's soul to the afterlife and he's not phased one lick by her beauty or her grace or her, I don't know. I'm trying to think of words that rhyme with grace uh heavenly face <laughs> and 
he comes, he snatches up the soul, and he starts on his walk back to the underworld. See, most people would be daunted seeing the actual god of death before them, but Savitri, she only got stronger. Her nerve got like steel, and she got up, and she follows the god of death as he carries her husband's soul away across the lands underneath this burning sun. Uh... Yamaraj demands that she leaves him alone, and I can only imagine that she's not just following him quietly. She's, like, following him and being like, give him back, give me my husband, bring him back. And he's like, no, <laughs> you need to leave me. Um, but she continues to follow him, and she continues to do it as her skin burns and her feet blister and bleed from the heat and the walk. And finally, the god stops his walk, and he turns around, and he's like, you can have one wish for your persistence because it amuses me but then you have to leave me alone but you can't ask for your husband's life back and she doesn't even hesitate you guys immediately she goes i wish that my father-in-law's sight would be restored yamaraj says done turns around and continues to walk uh back to the underworld uh some myths have him writing like a uh like some kind of seed it varies depending on where you're going from he's walking in this story so he turns around he continues to walk back to the underworld Savitri doesn't she doesn't fuck off she continues to follow him and this like frustrates Yamaraja's even more and he's just like my god like could you leave me the fuck alone and she doesn't say anything about that she just continues to nag him and harass him and maybe she changes tactics, you know, at some point and starts to like flatter him and offer him all sorts of gifts from her kingdom because she is a princess if he'll give her husband back to her. And he tells her, you know what, I'm really frustrated. I will give you a second wish because clearly you are persistent. She had to have been nagging him. There's no way. Um, and he tells her the rules from the first one still apply. You cannot wish for your husband's life back, but you can have anything else you want. So she wishes that her father-in-law's kingdom will be restored to him, again, without hesitation. She had this, like, locked and loaded. And he's like, done. Your father-in-law has his kingdom back. Now leave me alone. I'm going down into the underworld. Don't be a fool and follow me. So he starts to descend into the literal underworld, thinking that he's free of this troublesome wife. But when he looks over his shoulder, he is shook to his core because she's still following him she she did not indeed fuck off she continued <laughs> to stay the course this time a little bit more quietly so that he wouldn't know that she was following him deep into the underworld and this time instead of being annoyed Yamaraj is actually moved by her devotion and the fact that she will not quit following him even though now they're in the underworld and he tells her, I will give you one final wish. But as a god, I am telling you, my patience is at its limit. So you need to leave me alone after this. And she says, I absolutely understand. Thank you for your incredible patience. I do know what my final wish will be. And she wishes to be the mother of many children. And he says, done, granted, you got it. And he waves her away to dismiss her. But then Savitri hits him with like the Uno reverse. And she's like, actually, actually, <laughs> I've made a vow to the gods, uh, my father, the king and the holy sage that my fate would forever be entwined with my husband, Satyavan. And so it's impossible for me to have children with anyone else other than my husband. Because um, I swore myself to him. So I can't, uh, you can't fulfill your wish to me, and I can't be the mother of many children uh, without my husband. And Hamaraj, instead of being petty like a Greek god would, he was like, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Actually, I'm, I'm really impressed. Um, you know what? Have him. Take him. You want him clearly more than I do. And Savitri snatched up her husband's soul and left with Satyavan and was able to restore him to life by taking his soul back um and they were free free of the burden of his like terrible fate free of the underworld and death and they were able to return to her kingdom and subsequently her father's or her father-in-law's kingdom which has now been newly restored to him they're back in power he's an official prince again now Satyavan is and they were able to live out their days happily and comfortably 
live in the high life, but also with their many, many children. They had a ton of children, exactly like she wanted. Uh, and that's the tale uh, of Savitri and Satyavan. And the actual title of this tale is The Princess Who Outwitted Death. So you see how we avoided a spoiler. Um, but I just absolutely love this story. I love how clever Savitri is. I love that there is a female protagonist who has like agency and wit, and she isn't just like an object for a prince. She she seizes her own life by her hands, and she she outwitted death. You guys like that's big. Those are big moves. Um, so a little bit about the story. Um, the oldest version I was able to track down, and I believe is the oldest version, is found in the Vana Parva of the, oh, this one's hard, the Mahabhatra, Baharata, oh my god, Mahabharata. Uh, and some versions of the story have Yamaraj only granting her one wish. So she wishes for her father-in-law to be able to see his grandchildren in his palace. And, you know, as Satyavan is his father's only child, Yamaraj has no choice but to restore the eyesight, the kingdom, and Satyavan's life at the same time. That one's pretty neat. I love that, like, she was able to do it all succinctly in one wish, but cinematically, thematically for my story, it needed to be dramatic, so we drew it out. We did all three as the original version. Um, but I do like that, that they were able to, like, smoosh that together. But I also like that, like... She was married to her husband only for a year, but she was totally devoted to his family just as much as she was her own and gave back his family's power in addition to getting her husband back. So, like, amazing. This is the time where girl boss is not ironically applied. She did the thing. And I hope that you guys enjoyed this story. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. As always, Storycraft is a uh, series that is helped along by a request for stories from you guys. So let me know um, what stories you would like to see. And even like themes. I don't really know what to do. I don't think I'm gonna do a theme every month, but if you have an idea for a fun theme to apply to like fairy tales and myths and folklore, let me know. Cause I, I'll, I'll toss that in my, my list of things to do and we'll do another theme month. But for now, that's the end of our uh, month of romance and love. So I hope that you guys enjoyed that. I think we finished on a high note. Um, and I will catch you guys all in the next one. Until then, happy crafting. Bye.